Well, hello, viewers, and welcome to a very special episode. I'm having an interview today with Professor Roy Faulkner. Uh, he's going to explain who he is in a minute, but I have had him come and speak in my parish previously. He's a very learned and godly man, and it's an honor and a privilege to have him with us. So I hope that this interview will be edifying to you, particularly those who are in my own diocese in Leicester, but also with wider implications around the Church of England. Well, thank you for joining me, Roy. Thank you. Uh, so would you tell us a little bit about yourself, Roy? How did you come to faith and to Jesus? Have you been a Christian for a long time? Yeah, I, I've been a Christian uh, pretty much all, all my life. Uh, but I, I, I had my kind of faith reinforced and if anything like uh, became born again, really, in my time when I was in university, which is a long time ago now, I have to confess, uh, where... Uh, I particularly, I was at the uh, University of Cambridge in the in the university at um, uh, Churchill College there. Where at the same time that Francis Crick, the guy that uh, um, under got developed the understanding of the DNA molecule, um, uh, was in the same college as me, and I had chance to talk to him a lot. And he was an ultra humanist. Uh, he believed that since he'd understood the secret of life from a molecular point of view, there wasn't a need for God anymore. So I had to argue the Christian case against a very powerful man, fellow of the Royal Society, like the Nobel Prize winner. Um, uh, and uh, I, I found it very enlightening and challenging, but it, it reinforced my faith. Uh, and that's really where I grew much more strong in, 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 in the faith. And uh, since then, I've just carried on worshipping in the Anglican Church um, in various parts of the country. Um, but recently, um, since I had more retirement, since I've retired, I've had a bit more time to actually start looking to try to understand a bit more about how the Anglican Church works. And uh, sadly, I've come to the conclusion that uh, there are a lot of things going wrong at the moment. And so mm. I've gone on to General Synod, which has enabled me to uh, um, put some of my views a bit more effectually towards uh, to, to the, the central organization of the church. Wow, a fantastic testimony, brother, I've got to say. Wow, you're a brave Christian. Talk about a baptism by fire. Um, so tell me a little bit more about your time with General Synod. Um, how have you found serving on the Synod? And like, it was interesting there that you said, uh, once you started to learn how the Anglican Church and the Church of England works, uh, I think a lot of people are feeling there's, there's a great brokenness to it at the moment and that there's work needs to be done to, to, to restore us to a more gospel focused church. Um, so have you found that on General Synod? Well, yes. The uh, the reason I got on to General Synod was that I became involved with a group of people led by Marcus Walker up at uh, the Church of Great St. Bartholomew in London, who was leading this movement called Save the Parish. Um, and uh, I was, because I've written quite a few letters to the, the national dailies outlining some of the problems which are existing. And so I got uh, they, they, these people contacted me through this, this letter writing that I was doing and uh, they we had a meeting two years ago now just before the elections for General Synod and um, uh, that group of people worked very hard to encourage people like me to get voted on to General Synod on the ticket of the Save the Parish movement and that was the way I got, got into General Synod because they wrote my manifesto for me and it was a very convincing kind of an argument I think that I put forward and many people in the deanery who weren't uh, they weren't actually um, uh, observable they were below the parapet so to speak so they were able to v vote freely uh, I think without any kind of pressure from the diocese being put on them and yeah. as a result of that I came second in the ballot that uh, for Leicestershire or for Leicester's diocese and um so I got on to General Synod. When I, having got to General Synod, I discovered that there are probably, uh, out of the 600 or so people who are on General Synod, there we've, we've managed to get about approximately 150 people who are sympathetic to these views of saving the parish. So we haven't got into a situation where we're in the ma majority yet, but uh, there's a, con a, a sizable number of people there who are trying to further the aims which I'm going to talk about a bit, bit later uh, in terms of trying to to actually stand up to the diocese and try to make the parish and, and the, the uh, traditional frontline parish vicar become a lot more stronger in, in their um, their position in the church. 
Yeah, it's a very noble and godly cause. I'm impressed that in such a short amount of time, Save the Parish has, has got so many representatives and so many sympathetic voices on Synod. I mean, you know, you'll know these political things in the Anglican Church take forever to change, but that's that's quite impressive. So that's a, I think that's a work of God. Um, so here in Leicester Diocese, we are, so I think we're the test bed uh, for a fairly radical reorganisation of ministry and mission. Uh, my viewers probably won't have ever heard of it um, unless they live in Leicester. It's called the Minster Community Program. Um, so because we have so many global viewers and people around the UK, and of course this will apply, as I'm sure you'll tell you later, uh, more widely to other dioceses in the Church of England, would you mind giving us a little overview of what exactly is the Minster Community Program and, and how did we get to this point? Yeah, sure. Well, the Minster Community Program was given official approval uh, to the Diocesan Synod in um, uh, the 9th of October 2021, which is really now sort of nearly, nearly um, uh, or one and a half years ago. Uh, and, and essentially it laid out a very clear vision for what the diocese wanted in terms of the, the Minster community. And although they they never clearly indicated the motives behind all this, the, 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 the motive was purely financial. They, they have a 2.3, or there was a 2.3 million deficit in 2022 in the Leicester Diocese, and they were seeking to try to um, overcome this. So what they proposed was effectively uh, a, a huge merger of large numbers of already quite successful traditional parishes mm. into these minster communities so that you end up with a, a, a situation where uh, there are 234 parishes in the Leicester diocese and the proposal was to form about 20 minsters. Um, this meant that eight Tw groups of 12 parishes would be merged together into in, into each into a, into a minster now the result of doing this was that they engineered a situation where the current number of traditional frontline parish vicars is around about 100 and they were going to reduce this by 20 percent so that we'd only have 80 uh, vicars to, to service a, a, a congregation um, which was previously being served by 100 vicars so there's a 20% reduction in the number of vicars, and they did this by effectively creating these, these ministers, which are like some of the benefices which we have at the moment. Um, uh, and the, um, the, the idea was that there would be a central facility for with, with approximately two uh, or possibly three traditional vicars for each minster. So there'd be three vicars for what were originally 12 successful parishes. Um, and and the, you would the, the the idea of the community vicar being left in the parish was going to be destroyed. The, all these vicars would be in central administration in Leicester, uh, and so the community base of the vicar was was going to be lost completely. Um, um, and and if you wanted the vicar to do a service for you, you it's a dial of, dial a vicar service basically, and you've got these people coming up from or down from the central administration to, to take services in, in all of the, these parishes. Um, so uh, what it meant was that all traditional parishes, particularly those parishes which are still success, really successful in terms of being able to contribute through their parish share to, the, to pay the full cost of the vicar that they're getting, these people are being faced with the prospect of losing those vicars on a personal basis, on a community-led basis, uh, to allow these central facilities to, to continue. Um, so um, we, we were, we're left with a, a situation where uh, many people see uh, in traditional parishes, successful traditional parishes in Leicester, they see their... Uh, the money that they give in, in, in giving, which is largely to pay for the vicar, they see that mm. money being diluted effectively and, produ and given to a vicar in a central a a agency, uh, which has no direct community contact with the people in the, in the neighbourhoods concerned. Um, and so this loss of the traditional frontline community-based vicar is a central theme uh, throughout all of the, mm. the, this, this approach. And, and of mm -hmm. course, 
there is this 20% reduction in the number of vicars. So effectively, what they're doing is saving 20 vicars salaries. Uh, uh, and this is the thing that's going to uh, actually, um, uh, of, of course, uh, justify the, the move which they're trying to make. In, in addition to this, uh, I should add that one of the other proposals was that in each of these minsters, there would also be a new post created called an operations director. This would be somebody who would be recruited specifically to do all the paperwork that current vicars have to do um, uh, and would be a purely administrative role. But that was being used uh, as a substitute for traditional parish mm -hmm. vicars. Um, and, and, and so um, the uh, um, uh, the um, sorry, I, I, I've, uh, I've I've lost my screen at the moment. I, forgive me. I'm just going to have to. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm back again. Uh, so basically, these new operations directors were being uh, created uh, as a substitute for the vicars. So um, uh, uh, this is a, an example of the fact that the administration is taking over in this scheme because that effectively these extra operations directors uh, would reduce the number of really available spiritually guided min ministers in the mm. scheme, from, not from 100 to 80, but 100 to 60, because there'd be an extra 20 of those positions which were supposed to be operated by uh, traditional spiritual vicars, um, would be taken up by people doing uh, paperwork. Uh, and so, it is, again, all this reflects the fact that, that parishes are getting get less and less service from traditional vicars. Mm. Uh, the effort is to, to save money, uh, and it, there is the emphasis more and more on central administration, the, the loss of the community-based vicars, um, uh, in order to, to, to make up the deficit which the diocese is, is facing. And my argument is very strongly that there is no need for this deficit. There is money available in the Church of England to make this deficit up by other means, but I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a very dramatic restructuring. I think a lot of people aren't aware about how far reaching it is. Um, a lot of the time we are told that the parish boundaries won't be changed, which in a strict technical sense is true. But the actual, as you were saying, the actual form, the function of mission and ministry will be fundamentally changed. And one of the big issues I have is that the New Testament presents us with a model where a presbyter or a priest is planted in a church to care for the flock un under Jesus, of course and that they build these loving, pastoral, personal, spiritual, as you were saying, connections with their with their congregation. You know, they baptise their babies, they bury their dead, they marry people, they lead services every Sunday, but um, less, and you'll have, well, as you said, 80% cut, but then if you actually crunch the numbers to include these administrative posts for every minster, that'll be even less, 60% cut. So that will result in far less on-the-ground ministry from a priest, and if people think about just how much a vicar does in a week, uh, visiting schools, going to care homes, home visits, home communions, midweek communions. I mean, <laughs> we don't just work on a Sunday. Uh, but even if we did, if we only worked one day a week, 80, 60 percent cut of vicars. That's a, a lot less ministry. Um, yeah. And then that will fall to the lay people in the parishes who are, aren't trained, who really aren't called to lead ministry, to preach the gospel. Uh, or to administer the sacraments. Um, so it really is fundamentally changing the structure of ministry and mission. And also um, it basically eliminates the role of a traditional priest. Mm. It, well, it destroys the concept of a parish. I mean, I, I could just add one other point there. The, 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 looking at the financial side of things, what people also don't realise is that the traditional parish church council will also disappear because the proposal is to have what they call joint church councils which means that all the individual original parish church council will be um, merged into one uh, joint church council for all those parishes that have moved into the, the minster and what is not realized is that the assets which each parish church council maintains will also become the responsibility of the joint research count joint church council which of course is headed up by people in the central diocese and you can imagine what's going to happen is that they all will have a free-for-all with all the capital assets that um uh, parish church councils currently possess 
uh, and the individual parishes will even lose the control of the money that they've built up over the years to save for rainy days. And, and the, mm. the diocese is very vague when you start trying to ask questions about what will happen in this respect. But our financial autonomy is also being threatened by this scheme. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that point. And a lot of people uh, struggle with that. And, and as you say, that the answers are often vague uh, and they're not very clear. And, and they seem to be avoiding that question a fair bit, which is very challenging because uh, maybe my viewers don't know, but in uh, Church of England parishes, the PCC is a parochial church council. That's the, the, the people of the church who locally, along with their vicar, um, run their church. So that, that localized ministry is being highly centralized, you could say. And of course, the Minster proposal will cost money. It'll take money to pay for it. So where do people think that money's gonna come from? It has to come from the parishes. So that's a really important point that I think is, I'm glad you addressed it. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of diocesan rhetoric that goes around that every uh, church must be in a minster. Uh, that we, it's an unavoidable fact. Is that true, Roy? Absolutely. Uh, uh, it's being uh, uh, controlled from the central diocese, primarily through the archdeacons uh, in, in Leicester diocese. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and it's a, um, a classic example, in my view, of kind of. Uh, um, in internal uh, um, pressure being brought to bear uh, in, in an indirect and rather invisible way. Uh, so the, the, the whole approach has been one to kind of uh, try to bring people on board without them realizing it's happening. I mean, it was, the whole idea of the Minster Scheme was really originally proposed where we had a series in, in, in the period 2019 to 2020 when we were all invited as as congregations to look at various proposals that were being made uh, to um, make the diocese more efficient, and uh, it, it, they, this was these was conversations where people were actually asked to say what their views were on how how things should go forward. But then the actual proposals came and these discussions took place. All they were presented with were three varieties of the Minster scheme. At no point did anybody say, do we want to stay with the original the, the existing um, parish church system? So then they uh, uh, when they had these conversations and had these discussions, they then said, oh well everybody agreed. But, but this is the reason everybody agreed was they were never presented with the real alternative, which was to have, carry on with the traditional parish system. And this is an example of the way the the, the approach that the, the Minster scheme is being operated. It, it's a very surreptitious type of a, a, a behavior. And, and the, the, the current approach, there are, there are two um, uh, ministers being virtually created. Well, one is already was officially open, the Law and Abbey, one uh, last oh. last week um and that is actually up and running now and and yours in in um uh, in colville and, and that, that area is the second one and, and the process has been uh, we invite you to to join the minster scheme as if you know it was a great benefit that was being bestowed upon us all um and and uh, uh, there's, and all the positive arguments from the diocese side were put in, in the letters that were sent to the parishes, but none of the alternative arguments what, about what the alternatives were in terms of future progress were ever presented. And so parishes are being presented with an inverted commas invitation uh, to something which none of them would agree to if they were fully aware of the total the arguments for and against them that's uh, that's the way i see it mm -hmm. at the moment yeah which i i'm so thankful that you're talking to us today i think we need to raise awareness of this and uh, a lot of the discussions that i've heard have said that well if you're not going to be in this minster we'll find another minster for you so there is literally the option of saying that the pcc is the fundamental legally recognized body of the Church of England that can decide whether their parish joins or not. It's just omitted. It's not that they deny it. They just completely omit that that fact. And it's very sad because people therefore feel pressure. They feel very much like it's an inescapable inevitability when actually it's not. A PCC can choose to say, well, thank you very much, but no, thank you. Uh, we will keep our parish share. Um, we will not join this minster. We don't want to be merged into a sort of super benefice, a super grouping. 
um, of, of a large number of churches. We'd rather keep our minister and pay for them and carry on with the, the model that's been going on for you know, a thousand years in England. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, Ray. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you put it much better than I can. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, I think the, the the point really I should also emphasize is that we know that the, a benefice system has been operating in all dioceses in the UK for quite some time because there are we acknowledge many churches which are just are incapable of providing the funding needed to pay for a vicar. But this mm. minster scheme is biting in to the, 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 the parishes which are successful, which are giving yeah. m many cases m much more than they need for, to pay for the vicar. I mean, in my parish, for example, you know, we require the figures being calculated by the diocese, 58,000 pounds is required to pay for uh, 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 all the facilities, housing, pension and everything for a single vicar. Um, and in my parish, we, we, we were giving until last year 70,000 into this parish here. So there's extra money going in. And it's these parishes, the traditional parishes, and I calculate in Leicester, although the diocese won't let me have the exact figures, but I estimate that there are over 80 of the 237 parishes in, in Leicestershire that are giving more in their parish share than they need to pay for the vicar. And it's those parishes that are now going to lose the vicar, even though they had enough money to, mm. to pay for them. Um, and yeah. that can't be right because eventually the people who are giving the money now will turn around and say, well, what, what are we getting for this money? And, and so giving will go down, which is exactly the opposite of what one of the motives for behind the creation of the Minster Scheme was, was for. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, people will react. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and people tend to give generously to church if they believe in it. And they believe that you know they are building the kingdom of God in their local context. If they if they think the money, even if they just perceive the money is disappearing someplace, then it makes people very nervous. Another factor that I've found quite difficult with the minster is that it seems very insensitive to the theological differences in the Church of England. So, um, successful parishes, independent parishes, which you know haven't been beneficed or or get along with their little benefice. They, they tend to be of like mind theologically, um, but it seems like sort of mushing them all together is a recipe for disaster. And the same with sort of cutting the clergy numbers and expecting clergy to travel around these minsters. Well, you may have a clergy who is a clergy person who is utterly opposed to the theology of a church that they're expected to pastor and vice versa. So it yeah. seems rather chaotic. And I, I don't think that enough thought has been put into that. And I, I know we, we hear constantly there must be unity, 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 but it's it's institutional unity, not necessarily biblical unity. And, and the idea of taking into account the genuine, uh, genuinely held convictions of, of those Christians on whatever side of the theological camp they sit, it just seems ignored. It's just, it's purely practical. We need to just merge and everyone's going to do it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Um, Roy, would you mind telling us a little bit about some of the response to this? Um, what What's happening at a local level? Um, uh, in terms of what can people do uh, to, to respond to the Minster? Well, uh, um, I, I, I'm afraid I haven't got a good answer to that. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the problem, of course, is that the, the whole uh, parish system is, is, is a hierarchical. Uh, and, mm. and so the people in the diocesan headquarters, the archdeacons particularly, have power. Uh, they can sack or, or hire vicars at will, uh, and they, of course, are completely sold on the, the Minster argument, and therefore they uh, are eager to make sure that that policy is carried through as dictated by the diocesan synod uh, decision from the, that October meeting that I made. So anybody who tries to resist it is is going against their future career prospects, essentially. Uh, and, um, so although I, I know that a lot of people, you're very outspoken and you, you've done a lot to, to, to stand up to this, but I'd say the large majority of vicars realise that their future careers in some some respects are compromised by uh, speaking out. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to say there is a a lack of freedom of speech uh, available in within the the uh, the current situation we find ourselves um mm. and so 
Whereas if people were fully free to, to, to express their views, I think there would have already been a very much bigger backlash against uh, this, this, this proposed idea. Uh, mm. And, and uh, you know, people would have been able to talk openly about it. But um, it's, it's very difficult at the moment for, for many, many people like yourselves. I feel very sorry for, for people in your position because... You're, you're essentially being silenced uh, unnecessarily, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's a scary position to be in. And I think there is a, 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 you know, there's certainly clergy who are all for it, but I think as well there are clergy who are not and, they simmer, and, they're, and their congregations are simmering along in the background but feel very much like it's, it's very frightening to put your head above the battlements and to say, even just to ask questions, um, the, the pushback can be quite strong. Um, mm. So it's certainly something I've been praying for, uh, mm. because I, I think people people really should have that right to be to, to free to disagree and ask questions and be quite open about that without any 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 sense of fear. Um, you've mentioned a little earlier, and and that sort of what you just said touches on a little bit. There seems to be a, a high amount of, and I see this across the whole C of E, centralisation in dioceses. Um, centralizing power, money, assets, resources around the bishops and the hierarchy. And that historically has not actually been the case in the CV. It's been very much a, a localized um, church ministry model. Um, do you see that trend continuing in the future or will there be some sort of pushback to that? Oh, no, I think uh, the, the, what you say is very, very true, very, very much so. Um, the, 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 um, the, the position in, in the, the Church of England is one that um, it deserves a little bit of detailed discussion, which I'd, I'd like to just outline now if, if I Please. could. Um, um, if you look at the way in which the diocese administration, particularly their finances, are, are, are arranged, um, uh, taking Leicester as, a, as an, an example, um, they roughly Leicester gets roughly five million pounds a, a year to uh, from the parish share um, uh, to pay for vicars and tr training and cathedral and all, all, all that, that kind of thing. But it also gets an additional five million, another fifty percent from the the church commissioners or through what they call the archbishop's council. Um, uh, this is the central church facility, which, of course, has built up its assets over the years. And currently, these assets of this, uh, the church commissioners, are of the order of £10.1 billion. So they're earning a billion pounds a year in interest and, and, and um, endowments and whatever that are, that are coming in. And so at the moment, they contribute about um, £500 million a year of that to the diocese. Now, if you work that out, so it roughly works out that something in the region of each diocese gets um, um, five, five to 10 million, some of the bigger dioceses give it more, out of this church commissioner's money, half of their income comes from, from this source. And at the moment, um, this, this money, this excess money over and above what the parishes give, um, it is, is, is being, I'll be honest, frittered away on rather well-meaning but rather useless jobs from the point of view of trying to bring people to God spiritually within the communion. In other words, not, not jobs which are traditional frontline community-based parish vicars, which are the, the people we're talking about and which I believe should be the most important people in the whole church hierarchy. So um, th there is this large amount of money that's, that's available from the church commissioners, uh, but they obviously hand it out with certain strings attached. So you have to do uh, certain things. And one of the, um, uh, well, it was a good idea at the time, uh, the they, ideas they had was back in 2014, to produce, produce this so-called strategic uh, development uh, um, initiative. Uh, which was aimed at producing a whole range of frontline vicars, um, but in the, if you like, non-orthodox parish situation. So they, they call them inter, intergenerational churches, resource churches, or church plants, where certain parishes gave some of their congregation and their money to to support a new a new parish somewhere, usually in the 
city centres or urban centres or mm. things, things like this. And in the Leicester case, you know, it was basically enough money. They got enough money to pray for an extra 20 vicars over and above this um, 80, or well, the hundreds that I've been talking about, which are being reduced to 80 in the Minster scheme. So there's money available in these things. And what we have found is that the, there was a report produced by Sir Robert Choate um, uh, in, in 2021, which analysed this uh, strategic development funding initiative, how, how effective had it been? And, yeah. you know, the, the bottom line of all that was that the plan for all these new church plants and so on was that they were going to recruit something in the order of 83,100 new disciples, as the word was put. The figure, as it stood three years before the end of the scheme was due to be coming to fruition, 2024, 2023, they had recruited so far 11,183 disciples, roughly one-tenth of what they projected that they were going to get. So the scheme was a complete failure. But if you talk to any of the bishops, anybody in the diocese, they say, oh, it's a wonderful scheme and just the sort of thing we need. And so they're in continuing to invest in that sort of area. But now, because they're running into deficits for, because of inflation and so on, they're not just uh, simply saying, OK, well, we'll cut back on that in relation to inflation. They're taking money out of the traditional parish system, p paying people like you to, to yeah. pay for these uh, initiatives in the Strategic Development Fund. It's a huge fund. 176 million went into it. Um, uh, at the expense of, of, of the traditional parish vicar. And it's not, Choate has proved that the, the system doesn't work. Um, and yeah. so uh, this is one example of where the profligacy of the, of the diocese, uh, using money from the church commissioners, is pushing money in the wrong directions and not helping the traditional parishes, which is where, which is still, in my opinion, the lifeblood of, 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 of the community. Now, um, the, the other point then, t taking this Archbishop's Council money that I've been talking about, 500 mm. million a year comes down to all the dioceses in the country, 42 dioceses. Um, uh, they decided, uh, in their wisdom, I think, that they were only giving away 500 million of the hundred of the, of the thousand million that they were giving getting every year from their, their return on their assets. And so somebody did have the good idea uh, last year to say, okay, well, we're at the period, uh, fiscal period 23, 23 to 25, <clears throat> we will give an extra 100 million to the diocese. So it went up from this roughly 500, well, it's between three and 400 million, actually, to 500 million. So an extra 100 million. If you work this out, <clears throat> this could create enough money if it went directly to vicars to create another four, 40 vicar posts per diocese. <clears throat> That's an, incredible, that's an incredible yeah, amount yeah. of priests. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but what has happened, you talk to Bishop Martin in Leicester Diocese about this. He knows he's got this money. He says, I'm going to put more of it into these resource churches, church plants, and non-traditional parishes. Uh, that's where it's all going to go, because that's where I believe the future is, even though the Choke Report has proved beyond all yeah. doubt in, in a number of our people's views that this isn't isn't right so there's two examples of where there are vast amounts of external money coming down to the diocese who are then <clears throat> in their wisdom distributing it in in a way which is not in the interest of the traditional um, person in the congregation the parishioner who i think yeah. is the most important person in the church Absolutely, yeah. The people in the pews who have been faithful for many years, they are the they are the lifeblood of the C of E. And I mean, the parish system is a beautiful thing. It divides up the map of the whole country into these little chunks representing the kingdom of God. And um, for for centuries, priests have pastored to their to their congregations in the cities, in the rural areas, seeking out people to bring to Christ. I think statistically as well, a lot of mission statistics reveal to us that churches that have a good faithful, loving, Bible-believing vicar who digs in for the long haul of loving their flock and also loving the community around them and, and building connections and evangelizing, those churches do very well. They, they tend to grow. They tend to have healthy, uh, mature disciples. 
So it boggles my mind why you wouldn't pour money into training priests like that, why you wouldn't pour money into raising up more lay readers to help the priests or whatever it may be, even just the pressures of building and building maintenance. You know, we need to look after the buildings that people worship in. Many, many churches are struggling now even to pay for minor repairs because they have to send off so much of their money, which their people put into the plate or, or tithe through electronic means. And it just sort of seems to go off into thin air. We're told it's needed. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great insight. And thank you so much for sharing it with such great clarity that, you know, that the Church of England's not broke. <laughs> and yeah, and, and actually the Church Commission is a fairly generous in, in distributing this money to the diocese. But once it hits the diocesan bank, then it's up to the, the, the bishop and their leadership council and the diocese how they use that money. So it does raise questions of if those funds are being used effectively enough for actual mission and ministry. And, you know, we should be able to, I mean, it's not all about numbers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all for people growing in spiritual maturity, but we should be able to measure, for example, how many baptisms and how many confirmations, how many people are actually in, increasing in our attendance Sunday by Sunday because of the resources that we're spending. That, that to me seems logical. We want to see, we want to fulfill the Great Commission. We want to see people uh, baptized and discipled and brought into the life of the church. But as you say, a lot of these resource things, these fresh expressions, whatever they are, some of them can be helpful. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But uh, uh, from my observation and my experience, observation. a lot of them can be quite sort of, well, to use a, a buzzword, they can be quite woke. They can be quite out of touch with the actual parish the day-to-day -day life of people in the parishes. So I think that was a really important insight. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I just I add, oh, sorry, Roy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just add another point there. That, uh, I think it's, it, the, the diocese have forced the, this, this distinction between these um, resource churches, or whatever we've called them, as a, be a better word, and, and the traditional parishes, mm -hmm. because okay. they, they've diverted and, and concentrated the funding to one area alone and i think you and every, probably everybody in colville will see that the, the the situation is so fluid and dynamic at the moment i mean we've got vast housing estates here in loughborough where i am you know going up so that whereas we might have been my parish church might have been regarded as very rural at one point right out in the country we've got a, a three and a half thousand house housing estate being built on our doorstep right now so suddenly we we could be the center of a new resource church but the, the diocese doesn't seem to think they will always neglect the traditional parish church um mm. so there must be some new geographic site where we can cater for these new de de demographic changes that are going on and i don't think they've seen the light in the sense of what's happening in, demographically in the the housing situation particularly in the east midlands at the moment which seems to be one huge building site to me. As far as that Great be. point. There are houses going up everywhere. Yeah. yeah and so and we, yeah, parish yeah. churches could, if they were resourced, evangelize those people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But there is a, un, as yet a, unreached because we're too busy trying to fix leaks in the roof or whatever it is or yeah. send off our, our share. So it's a yeah, really good point. Um, I mentioned statistics and I know you have um, some statistics to share with us. So would you mind talking through some of those? Because people, out there. I, I'm not a maths guy, but people out there uh, love a graph <laughs> on yeah, my channel. So yeah. yeah, would you like to share a bit of that, Roy? Yeah, well, of, of, of course, this is the background to much of what I've been saying that I've done, well, since being on General Synod, you're allowed to ask questions, but particularly <laughs> I've been asking questions in General Synod since I've been on about the actual numbers of people who are employed in various activities within the the, the the church of england and um as a kind of a yardstick I, i've also been looking at of course how the 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 congregation sizes in 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 the church of england have been changing over the last um uh, well probably the last 70 years i started the analysis from uh, 1959 and and if if you look at these the, the graphs which d demonstrate the number of bishops we had the number of lay readers the number of traditional parish vicars and crucially 
the number of support staff employed in the diocese and headquarters, and you plot these numbers against time from 1959 up to the present time, you come up with some very disturbing trends, uh, which tend to support many of the arguments that we've, we've talked about. The first is, of course, that the general congregation sizes, uh, the number of people going to church, who, in my opinion, are the most important people in the church, uh, has dropped from roughly 3 million uh, in 1959 to currently around about 700,000. Mm. And uh, one of the graphs which you your your uh, colleagues will be seeing is that I've, I've extrapolated one of the graphs to to uh, extend to see how this trend would go and the forecast assuming that the trend in the drop of number of co uh, people in the congregations has dropped from uh, three million to seven hundred thousand between 1959 and now the forecast is that the congregation size will be zero by 2045. So there will be nobody left in the Church of England if, if the current trends are going on now in terms of the actual uh, uh, congregation size. Now, there are all sorts of arguments you can bring in. Con concomitant with this, you, you will see that the number of vicars has reduced from something like 15 to 20,000 in 59 to around 7,200 nationally at, at the moment. These are all national figures across the whole country. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and and so there's been a parallel decline in the number of priests, which a number of us would argue in Save the Parish particularly that this is part of the cause for it because the reduced the number of vicars means there's less accessibility of potential converts and congregants coming into the church. Uh, and, and this is the prime cause of it. But a lot of people argue very strongly against us on that one and say it's a causality argument and they say that the, the actual numbers of people have dropped because, uh, mm -hmm. the, because the, 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 um, the numbers of vicars have dropped because the congregation size have dropped and you know you can use all these arguments but one thing you can't deny from those graphs that you you see in front of you is that there's an upward trend in one of those curves and that is the number of um, people employed in the diocesan head office, reflecting vast numbers of new administrative posts who do nothing to bring the word of God to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and those numbers have been increasing since 1959 to the point that there were in 1959 there were probably over the 42 dioceses about 500 people employed in in diocesan support work. That number is now nearing 4,000. It's, 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 multiplied by 10 over the same period Good heavens. the only conclusion you can come through from this analysis is that the more support staff in the diocese means fewer people in the in the, in the congregations and and so the central message from this really is that the diocesan administration is getting filled up with very nice very well-meaning jobs um, mm. largely connected with human resource management uh, getting diversity right getting inclusivity right uh, and getting equality issues all, all, all right but we employ people sometimes on sixty thousand pounds a year to, to ensure that this is is all being done and, and so the whole um these these statistics show really show up where things are going wrong in, in the Church of England. It, and it, I have to say, it is in the diocese. The church commissioners on top are bringing the money down, yeah. but then the diocese are spending the money not on the most important job of all, that is frontline vicars like you, Brett, but but on these these kind of, well, you've mentioned the word woke jobs uh, and, and a lot of other uh, it, it, types of jobs, which, uh, well, for example, they employ someone involved with generous giving so they're now spending money to try and get more the parishes to give more in their parish share you know it's that kind of convoluted kind of approach which just uh, it can't be right in my opinion i'm sorry uh, and, i agree uh, with you brother i mean if you were running a business you would review your spending and you'd realize you were just banging your head against a brick wall and, and it's nonsensical yeah. like Yes, it, yes. Don't just keep. Uh, what does Einstein say? That the the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I mean, yeah. Yeah. we've been going around in circles like this in the C of E for twenty, thirty years, and nothing's changed. It just keeps getting worse. Like, okay, maybe what we're doing is fundamentally flawed. 
And we should just go back to our basics, our roots of winning the nation for Christ at a parish level, parish by parish. Mm. But, you know, you just it just seems like they throw money away. They throw money at things that have no proven test run uh, yeah. track record of being successful. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is a there is a solution to this. I I, I always like. I, I wanted to get some hope. Come on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, you know, of course, the the the, um, uh, the the issue really is that uh, you talk to Bishop Martin about this. I mean, I've obviously I've just had many discussions with him, and he argues that you you legally he has to have all these posts now. The the, the whole idea of operation of business administration is now got to the point where you have to have an, a diversity officer and you have to have an equal opportunities officer in your organizations. And, okay, uh, the, there is a slight argument. I, I'm sorry, I don't actually agree with it, but uh, you, you could say there is a there is a legalistic approach. And so our, our approach is to say, okay, that's, uh, that's a, a point one could make, but there are 42 dioceses in the Church of England. Each one of them has all these extra offices. And I, I'm making a private member's motion to General Synod in, in York in, in the summer, which is proposing that we collect all these well-meaning jobs and just make one group of them up in London, wherever it is, and take all that bit out of the individual diocese administration. So we reduce the, the number of these kind of jobs from the but being multiplied by 42 as it is at the moment and just have it multiplied by one so you mm, streamline the yeah. requirement the legal requirement is there um, but the church of england has got officers concerned with these issues um but only one lot of them rather than 42 lots of them that way you would save millions in the diocese expenditure overnight and so that's that's what my motion and it's put, supported by Save the Parish Movement will be, that we set up an inquiry effectively to try to see in which we can, in a, we won't say merging diocese, that's, that's very, that's red hot inflammatory kind of stuff really, but a way of actually cutting down on this share of the, the cake which mm. is being gobbled up by these uh, well-meaning type jobs at the expense of traditional frontline vicars who are the most important groups of the lot. Yeah, I, I think it's important. I, I picked up on the word you said there, like setting up an inquiry. There seems to be very little transparency, and that's what bugs me. You know, who who is who dares to question the the diocesan bishops? You know, the diocesan boards of finance. And if you do dare, then you don't always get very clear answers, or sometimes you get some antagonism. So I think I, one of the things I, I value about Save the Parishes is it's grassroots. It's just good, honest Christians who love their churches, who love the C of E, and who want to see it thrive. That's the agenda. The agenda is just to see the church thriving again and to have that 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 group of people with a heart for God in his church growing is very, very encouraging. But also it does provide a, a transparency and accountability. And I think a lot of that has been lost in, in the, the recent decades in the C of E as, as power has been centralised. You know, there's this very much don't don't ask questions kind of attitude. So it's really encouraging to hear Save the Parishes and people like you who are so godly and so faithful and very brave. I commend your bravery, brother, for standing up and saying, hey, let's just ask some simple questions here. Let's look at some actual just cold, hard facts, just facts and, and examine those. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I, just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 we're coming to the conclusion. I, I sense at the yeah. moment. Um, I, <laughs> You're I, a wise, I, I, discerning like, man. I would like to, to try to say that you know yeah. a lot of what I've said is it could be regarded as a kind of a, a mm -hmm. confrontational approach, and and I, I, that's the last thing I want to have mm -hmm. happen. And I, this has my, my, been my basis of all my discussions with the diocese and synod and with Bishop Martin and so on. Uh, I come from the point of saying. I, like you, I want to increase the, the size of the church. I, I want to see it thrive. And, and everything I've said is trying to do that. And, and, uh, but a lot of people see it being as, a, as being a threat. And, and I don't, we, we've got to adopt this, this kind of mm. uh, conciliatory approach in respect to trying to bring about some of the things mm. that I've been talking about I want to do. Um, or else, if, if we try and do it in a confrontational way, we're never going to get anywhere at all. So work. Bishop Martin, he accepts that point, and, and I, I, I'll give him credit. He's, he's not dogmatic. He, 
it's still going in the wrong direction, but he accepts that, that I'm working to the same ultimate objective as he is, that is to increase the size yeah. of his flock. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a good godly Christian man, and he has a heart for seeing people one for Christ. And I think in the body of Christ, there should be room for us all to have disagreements and and for that, that information to be distributed. And if it ends up that, you know, the diocese goes in a different direction, well, I think we people should be humble enough to accept that. Um, and I agree with you. It shouldn't be confrontational. It should be that we just just bring uh, these things to light. We just speak about them openly and let people make up their own conclusions and their own minds with as much available information from both sides of the discussion as possible, which I think is really important. Um, you're right. We are. We're going to wrap in a minute, but I, I just wanted to. I love the theme of hope we had there, and I just thought I'd pick up on a little. In the pre-show, we were talking about some stuff that's happening at the the national level with Save the Parishes, which seems to me to be a, a strong move of the Holy Spirit. So I was wondering if you could just touch on that briefly. Well, uh, I, I think I have probably kind of covered most of the of the point there. That the the, the, um, the the Save Parish movement is very much supporting the kind of measures we we, we all seem to have identified the the diocese as being the weak link at the moment in in terms of fulfilling the the major objectives that we're, we're we're trying to to get involved with and the people in the save the parish movement are extremely dedicated and uh, and very very strong christians uh, i have every um respect for their the de deepness of their faith um mm -hmm. but they they see i think more clearly um that there is um a way forward to, to try to readjust the balance in in favor of the traditional parishes in the way that the the, the church works and um at the moment we are not only working through general synod the, the, the roughly a quarter of the people in general synod supporting this kind of approach but uh, i should say that we, we we've also um, been in parliament talking to mps uh, 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 substantially about this and uh, i would encourage really? anybody in parishes now to bring these matters to 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 their local mp because we've done this in my case in loughborough jane hunt has been very cooperative she was at all these meetings we've had in parliament over the last um, uh, last uh, year we've held, held two meetings in 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 the houses of parliament bringing to the attention of the mps the, the things that are going mm -hmm. wrong in the diocese in the church of england and the and parliament basically is the ultimate uh, arbiter in in what the church mm -hmm. of england does they yeah. rule even what Justin Welby does and says, and so this uh, the, the MPs have recognised the validity of our arguments in the same way that, as you say, we we've recognised it, but the diocese haven't. Um, and so there is there are moves going ahead at much higher levels, even than the church commissioners in Parliament, mm -hmm. which we're all su are supportive of this thing, and and any encouragement people can can get from their own local MPs in, in this move, it would be welcomed because uh, I think the more constituents who start re raising this issue with through through their MPs, through Parliament, will bring even more pressure on General Synod to actually do something about it along the lines that we're proposing. Well, praise God for that move. And you're right, as you say, um, the C of E is the established church, so canon law is English law. And I think people that gives people a sense that they, they can do something in their own little sphere of influence. They can write to their MP. I mean, I know members of my own parish have joined to save the parishes and that they're excited. They feel like they actually can contribute. They're not voiceless. They're, they can actually have their voice heard. Uh, and I think as well that that increases that transparency, doesn't it? It increases that accountability. Um, and it says, OK, you know, it's a, it, there, there are people in the halls of power who want to ask questions about this now too. And I mean, that's important that MPs are involved because as the established church, you know, the C of E has important civil roles in the, well, we just saw that yesterday at the coronation, you know, well, we have these important civil roles in the nation um, to represent the gospel to the nation. And so even if MPs aren't Christians, most MPs would say, we would like the parish church to remain thriving and independent and healthy for the betterment of our communities. And, I think for a lot of people as well, it's traditional. So changing something that is age old and sort of woven into the fabric of English culture, I think even a lot of people who don't come to church very often who or maybe don't even follow Jesus would find that to be quite alarming. 
Yeah. So it's it's important to be really vocal about it. Yeah. Well, right. Any 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 final thoughts you want to share, brother? No, you you express the thoughts of myself much better than I do it myself. So <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Well, may I close with a prayer? Yes, of course. Gracious God, thank you so much for Roy and for Save the Parishes and for all those wonderful people in the pews up and down the nation who love Jesus and serve him and try to build their local church. We pray for your blessing upon them, that you bring would bring them peace uh, in sometimes confusing times and that we would keep in our hearts and our minds that certain knowledge that Jesus is Lord of all, that he is King of Kings and that he rules over his church and ultimately uh, even the gates of hell can't overcome it. So he will build his church and continue to work through it. And I just pray for uh, Save the Parishes as they advocate for the local ministry of people in every single community up and down England, that they would be blessed and guided with discernment and wisdom. Thank you for Roy and the time he shared with us and uh, the edifying information that I, I'm sure will build up many Christians. So we just pray, Lord Jesus, for your blessing upon the parish churches of England, that by your grace, they would return to be thriving and overflowing with people and reaching out with the, the salt and light of the gospel. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roy. God bless you, brother. Thank you for listening to me. You're most welcome. Bye.